Welcome back to Hello Nigeria. It's time for our guest focus of the day. Now, of course, party primaries are over, candidates have been chosen, and it's time for them to do their media rounds. So sitting with Oliver and I today is the presidential candidate for the, let me get the party right before I do forget that, the New Progressive Movement, and he's also the CEO of Africa Business and Investment Groups. Now, he's a 38-year-old man. He has a dream for Nigeria, and we want to hear all about it. His name is Emmanuel Etim, and I'm so happy to have him on set today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks Thank for having me, Leila. Thank you. Now, it's very interesting to know that you're running. Would you say this is based on the not-too-young-to-run law? You're 38 years old. So I'll start by saying I actually started my race with the New Progressive Movement, mm. But then they cancelled the primaries on me 72 hours before it Why so? and had to quickly go shop for a new party called the Change Nigeria Party, which is where I am candidate right now. So they cancelled the party seven, the primaries on you? They cancelled it on me and returned back my money. Why did they do that? Uh, I think it's conflict of interest and other people who, powerful people with resources who thought that, you know, my running on the party would jeopardize their intentions to use the party maybe as a platform to to do whatever they wanted to do on the election day. Hmm. Shouldn't everybody have an equal right? Everybody who is a member of a political party have an equal right to signify their interest and then be allowed you know, to be given the chance for other people to vote for them. Shouldn't that be the thing, Leila? Mm. Well, that's not just the case. I mean, I went through the process, joined the party, did the rounds, uh, met the NEC, met the NWC, prepared for the you know primaries, did everything I was necessary, paid the, the money I had to pay. And it was cancelled. So was essentially, like a lot of that was then based on godfatherism within the party that did not necessarily favor you. Uh, well, not just godfatherism within the party, godfatherism outside of the party, external influences on the party, okay. which, you know, saw me as a potential threat. Okay, I think that's a brilliant start for this conversation then, because what we often find is that godfatherism is playing an inherent role in the Nigerian polity. So mm. unfortunately, a lot of people who are upcoming in politics, a lot of people who are running under smaller parties that are not necessarily the two big fish that we have in the polity, mm -hmm. find themselves struggling to mobilize the funds for their campaign. Mm -hmm. Now, what we find is that you can turn to crowdfunding, for example, but how does crowdfunding compete with godfatherism on the level that it is in Nigeria today? Well, look at it two ways. What is godfatherism and, and what's the money look, you're looking mm. for? You cannot necessarily finance a campaign with the money you have or your own resources. I mean, I allocated about 100 million out of my resources, saved money to put into the campaign, but how much can that do? Mm. You still need to mobilize resources from Nigerians. And, and that's where the difference is, because that person who is a godfather or who is putting depending on the amount of money you're putting, can be a godfather. It could be a young person who is putting money on your campaign, they're a godfather. They, don't know, they are determining how the campaign goes and what you do or don't do. The challenge we have here is that so many people who are at a level of life, who have made money either by taking it from public resources, because most of them don't do the business that we know they are doing, that making money from. And they are trying to keep with the young people out of the system by either offering you money not to contest or offering money to step aside or spending money on the party to prevent you from emerging. So what is it that drives you? What is it that's making you want to run? Because first of all, you've had several stumbling blocks that mm -hmm. could have discouraged you from running, but yet you still decided to forge ahead. In fact, you left the party, went to another party, yes. and then you got the um, certificate, the return certificate there, yeah. and now you are running. Contested the primaries, got six other parties to endorse me and affirm me, actually. Okay, so you went through all of this. Yeah. So what would you say is that thing that is driving you to well, keep doing this? Well, I think it's a journey of 20 years that believes that everybody is born equal and everybody has a right to succeed. That's number one. That those of us who have had resources and opportunity to make decisions for our life should pay the sacrifice to help others achieve that. Uh, I think the third reason also is that when you look, when I look, for example, at what happens in Nigeria and what I've seen around the world, we have no excuse to be where we are. We literally have no excuse to keep Nigerians where they are. And the only reason why this is happening is because you have an elite class, either economic elite or political class of people who don't understand the realities of the Nigerian and what it takes to do to change that. Okay, this is very interesting, very interesting. And I want to take us back to the not too young to run law because yeah. you just mentioned as well, the young people do also deserve a level playing for, um, field, sorry, within the policy. Now, we see the not too young to run law, we get excited, it sounds great, you can run for president at the age of 35. But how 
How credible is the same law when at the end of the day, the average 35 year old Nigerians a day does not have, for example, 45 million Naira, that hard hitting cost that a party like the APC has on their nomination forms? Well, they shouldn't have had 45 million. The, 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 the Electoral Act says you shouldn't charge more than 10 million Naira. So the fact that they have that amount of money is already illegal. But where yeah? does a 35 year old even get 10 million Naira just to actually express interest in running for the office of the president. You can get it from supporters. If people support your integrity and your personality and your commitment to other people's affairs, you can mobilize that resources from Nigerians. So I don't actually think that raising 10 million is a challenge. I, I think the challenge more is the party structures that continuously impoverish or keep young people out of, this, out of the process. I'll give an example. If I'm able to get, say, a, 1 million Nigerians to so give me 360 million naira, 360 naira, sorry. I have 360 million naira to do what I want to do during elections. So how do I get 1, 1 million Nigerians to give me that money? That's the question. And that's where either you have the, you know, the popularity of name or you have been long enough, like have been 20 years down the line working to ensure that an opportunity like this comes in. And now the not young to the law does give me the opportunity four years ahead of when I would have come out actually. I come out in July and my intention was to come out in 2023. But when the law came out, I'm like, okay, what am I waiting for? I can do it now. And of course, with the, the, the situation, the incumbency has created, makes it only necessary that I should come out now to win. And should I not win, gives Nigerians the hope that there is an alternative that is going to go into office to do things that actually affects the everyday Nigerian. Lead us through your political journey. Oftentimes, they say before you get to the, you know, the top power, the top, uh, the highest office in the land, you would have started from somewhere. So. I'm, I'm guessing that you started as maybe a student union government representative where you're very active. And why did you not start maybe from... Have you even gone through any other political... Grassroots politics. Grassroots, yeah, more like... Well, let's say, let's say, what is a politician? A politician is a person who seeks political office or power through in a bureaucratic system. So not just in terms of elective office within you know, uh, you know uh, say, a community. It could be within an institution like the United Nations where actually I had most of my career from a very young age at 15. I was a consultant for the UN and through that I held different office, you know, responsibilities across the line. Um, I was very active actually in supporting the political processes much more than going for, you know, for office. And every time I wanted to come out, my age was a challenge. So either I was too young to be a minister at the time I was nominated for it, I was too young to be a governor at the time I wanted to go for it, I was too young to be a House of Rep member at the time I wanted to go for it. So I've had that particular uh, uh, disadvantage. But I have played different roles over 20 years from helping define national policies on youth, on education, on health, on, um, on um, national development planning. I've played all those roles, helping in terms of domestic financing for them as well. I was part of medium term expansion frameworks for Nigeria for two terms. So I've been actually at the center of how these policies were developed, implemented, financed for the last two decades, okay. whether in Nigeria or at the United Nations or the African Union as well. Uh, the Niger Delta Technical Committee, for example, if you remember that process, I played a very critical role in ensuring Nigerians participated in the process because I led the uh, what they call the um, the the uh, the memoranda process. You know, getting Nigerians to write in, analyze that, present it to the plenary of the committee, and then write the report and put the recommendations forward. So I played all of that role. Okay, that's very interesting to see that you've been involved right from the very crux of everything. I like to hear that. Now, let's speak about policies. You mentioned that you've worked a lot on policies. Can you please give us an example of a policy on health that you have worked on and mobilized that is currently efficient in Nigeria today? So before now, there was something called the National Adolescent Health Policy. I helped with the drafting of that policy, helped with the strategic plan development of the policy, costed, costed for that policy, and helped mobilize resources from the international community to get it implemented. And I was a member of the ministerial committee headed by Professor Luke Aransom Kuti, who is late now, for like four years in helping ensure that policy was implemented. In fact, to a at the point that I got thrown out of the committee because I said I need to get more young people into the process. I was just the only one for, for a while. And then from that, um, I moved on to do what we call the universal health coverage advocacy work to get countries to implement universal health coverage and mobilize domestic financing to implement it as well. Okay. Now let's look at your young person. You're aspiring for the highest office in the land. Mm -hmm. You can currently analyze the current office, the current person in occupation or the current administration that we have, yeah. what would you say are some of the pitfalls of our current administration? What could you do differently if you were in power now? Well, uh, three things. Number one, I'll focus my leadership around engaging young people um, in terms of, I want to give you a very clear example. Do you realize that as we speak, a young person has created a cassava peeling machine 
that can peel cassavas in large quantity. That's never been done before, as we speak. And that young man graduated from university recently, and he's made that machine, but he's going nowhere with it. He needs about 500,000 to invest in getting it to the next level and then probably make it available for commercial use. Um, do you realize that there is a young woman who is an architect, she's creating what I call the future of homes in Nigeria, and looking at how you can actually build a three-bedroom flat on a plot of land with no more than seven million naira. Do you realize as we speak, maybe a bit far-fetched, you know, a very young man, he's, I think you've read that before, he's the youngest, highest paid robotic engineer mm. in the world. Now, you have a leadership that does not connect with what Nigerians can manufacture, do, or invent. You have a situation where the largest, most um, uh, a critical working class of Africans are Nigerians, but have no respect around the world, not even within Africa. <laughs> As a Nigerian, I would do differently as president in ensuring that the everyday Nigerian has access to credit. Not just credit in terms of working in the bank and you're told to bring your grandmother's land you know, in order to get access to credit, but the government provides credit guarantees to enable you to have access to refinancing, to do whatever you choose to do, and to ensure that you succeed at doing it. So I want to run a government where the budget is not a budget based on just capital expenditure that you spend <coughs> on importation, but it's based on capital expenditure that helps the Nigerian to export. Because if you don't get Nigerian manufacturing and exporting, there is no way Nigerians will be rich. You'll have a rich country with poor citizens, isn't it? I want to have a country where 53 million people can be taken out of poverty in, in 24 months by implementing comprehensive universal health coverage. I want, to, I want to lead a country where I am accessible as president. It's, it's, you know, presidency is not the big man affair that sits in, at the villa and disconnected from the reality of Nigerians. But it is a situation where I can walk into, um, into hard right, but I can walk into a mall you know, and find out what is the challenge of the Nigerian manufacturer, the Nigerian exporter, the Nigerian student. Basically something really inclusive and all important. Very inclusive. So, that would, would, so these are some of, basically some of the pitfalls you've, had, um, you've recognized in our current administration. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying that pitfalls, but I'm not putting as pitfalls. I'm putting out what I will do Recommendation in response to those pitfalls, yes. Okay, interesting. Now, we're going to wrap up the conversation, but real quick, let's just ask you, do you honestly think that as you are running, you are going to win? Honestly? Yes. Yes. Okay. Why? Because we cannot continue to do the same things over and over again and expect different sets of results. And if Nigerian youth, who are actually the ones with the power, listen, the politicians and the parties have the power to the point where they emerge the candidates, okay? That's where the party structure is strongest. But when it comes to the voters or the voting time, it's not that the parties that have the power, it's the Nigerians <coughs> that have the power. So if Nigerians realize that actually on election day, it's not the parties that will actually emerge the president, but Nigerians themselves going out to vote, I'll win. Fingers crossed. Wish you all the best. On thank that. you very well, much. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right. We have been speaking with Emmanuel Etim, and he's shared with us his journey so far, his political career, and hopes for Nigeria, his Nigerian dream. To enjoy more of these our Ugonke videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.